유명한 영화 테드쌤입니다. 버니큘라 2 Music in the night I feel at this time there are a few things you should know about the Chester. He is not your ordinary cat. But then, I'm not your ordinary dog. Since an ordinary dog wouldn't be writing this book, would he? Chester came into the house several years ago as a birthday gift for Mr. Mulder, along with two volumes of G.K. Chesterton, hence the name Chester, and the first edition of Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. As a result of this introduction to literature, and given the fact that Mr. Mulder is an English professor, Chester developed a taste of reading early in life. I, on the other hand, have developed a taste for books. I found Jonathan Livingston Seagull particularly delicious. From Chester's kittenhood on, Mr. Mulder has used him as a sounding board for all his students' lectures. If Chester Chester doesn't fall asleep when Mr. Mona is talking. The lecture can be counted as a success. Every night, when the family is sleeping, Chester goes to the bookshelf, selects his midnight reading, and calls upon his favorite chair. He especially likes mystery stories, the tales of horror, and the supernatural. As a result, He has developed a very vivid imagination. I'm telling you this because I think it's important for you to know something of Chester's background. Before I relate to you the story of the events following the arrival of Nicola in Tower, let me begin with that first night. It seems that. I ran to sleep. Chester, still stewing over the lost milk, settled down with his latest book and attempted to ignore the rumbling in his stomach. The room was dark and quiet. This did not prevent his reading. Of course, since, as you know, cats can see in the dark. A shaft of moonlight fell across the rabbit's cage. Spilled onto the floor below. The wind and the rain had stopped, and as Chester read, as the elder Bruce followed the house of the usher, he became increasingly aware of the eerie stillness that had taken their place. As Chester tells it, he suddenly felt compelled to look at the rabbit. Is a 
a band of gypsies traveling through the forest in their wagons. Chester answered, "Oh yes, it was come back to me now. Plantation wagons? No, covered wagons. The gypsies travel all through the land, setting up camps around great bonfires, doing magical tricks, and sometimes." If you cross their palms with a piece of silver, they will tell your fortune. You mean if I give them pork, they tell my fortune? I asked. Bristly. Chester looked at me with a disdain. Save your silverware, he said. It wasn't a caravan after all. I was disappointed. What was it? I asked. Chester explained that when he looked out the window, he saw Professor Micklewhite, our next-door neighbor, playing the violin in his living room. He listened for a few moments to the haunting melody and sighed with relief. I've really got to stop reading these horror stories late at night, he thought. It's beginning to affect my mind. He yawned and turned to go back to his chair and to get some sleep. As he turned, however, he was startled by what he saw. There, in the moonlight, as the music filtered through the air, sat the bird, his eyes intense and staring, an unearthly aura about them. Now this is the part you won't believe," Chester said to me. But as I watched, his lips parted in a hideous smile, and where a rabbit's buck teeth should have been, two little pointed fangs glistened. I was sure what to make of Chester's story, but the way he told he told it, it set my hair on end. Several years ago, as a birthday gift to poor Mr. Murdoch, along with two volumes of G.K. Chesterton, hence the name Chester. At the first edition of Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities, as a result of this introduction to literature, and given the fact that Mr. Murdoch is an English professor, Chester developed a taste of reading early in life. I, on the other hand, have developed a taste for books. I found Jonathan Livingstone's cigar particularly delicious. From Chester's kittenhood on, Mr. Murna has used him as a sounding board for all his students' lectures. If Chester does fall asleep when Mr. Murna is talking, the lecture can be accounted a success. Every night. Sleepy, Chester goes to the bookshelf, selects his midnight read, and calls up on his favorite chair. He especially likes mystery stories and tales of horror and supernatural. As a result, he has developed a very vivid imagination. I'm telling you this because I think it's important for you to know something of Chester's background. Before I relate to you the story of the events following the arrival of Bonito into our home, let me begin with that first night. It seems that after I went to sleep, Chester still strewing over the lost milk, settled down with his latest book and attempted to ignore the rumbling in his stomach. The room was dark and quiet. This did not prevent his reading. Of course, since 
is, as you know, cat can see in the dark. The shaft of moonlight fell across the rabbit's cage and spilled onto the floor below. The wind and the rain had stopped, and as Chester read Edgar Elipus, the fall of the house of Usher, he became increasingly aware of the eerie stillness that had taken their place. As Chester tells it, he suddenly felt compelled to look at the rabbit. I don't know what came over me, he said to me the next morning, but a cold chill ran down my spine. The little bunny had begun to move for the first time since he had been put in his cage. He lifted his tiny nose and inhaled deeply, as if gathering sustenance from the moonlight. He slid his ears back close to his body, and for the first time, Chester said, I noticed the peculiar marking on his forehead, what had seemed an ordinary black spot between his ears took a strange V shape, which connected with a big black patch that covered his back and each side of his neck. It looked as if he was wearing a coat. No, more like a cape than a coat. Through the silence had drifted the strains of a remote and exotic music. I could have sworn it was a gypsy violin, Chester told me. I thought perhaps a caravan was passing by, so I ran to the window. I remembered my mother telling me something about the caravans when I was a puppy, but for the life of me, I couldn't remember what. What's your caravan? I asked. Feeling a little stupid, a caravan is a band of gypsies traveling through the forest in their wagons. Chester answered, Oh, yes. It was coming back to me now. Station wagons? No, covered wagons. The gypsies travel all through the land, setting up camps around great bonfires, doing massacre tricks, and sometimes, if you cross their palms with a piece of silver, they will tell your fortune. You mean, if I give them a fork, they'd tell my fortune? I asked, bristlessly. Chester looked at me with a disdain. Save your silverware, he said. It wasn't a caravan after all. I was disappointed. What was it? I asked. Chester explained that when he looked out the window, he saw Professor Michelin, our next door neighbor, playing the violin in his living room. His, he listened for a few moments to the haunting melody and sighed with relief. I've really got to stop reading these horror stories late at night. He thought, it's beginning to affect my mind. He yawned and turned to go back to his chair and get some sleep. As he turned, however, he was startled by what he saw. There in the moonlight, as the music filtered through the air, sat the bunny, his eyes intense and staring an unearthly aura about them. Now, this is the part you want to believe, Chester said to me, but as I watched, his lips parted in hideous smile, and where rabbit buck this should have been, two little pointed fangs glistened. I wasn't sure what to make of Chester's story, but the way he told it, it set my hair on end. Nicola, Chapter 2 Music in the Night I feel at this time there are a few things you should know about Chester. He is not your ordinary cat. But then, I'm not your ordinary dog, since an ordinary dog wouldn't be my husband, would he? Chester came into the house several years ago as a birthday gift for Mr. Morgan.
Along with the two volumes of G.K. Chesterton, has the name Chester. And the first edition of Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities, as a result of this introduction to literature, and given the fact that Mr. Mono is an English professor, Chester developed a taste of reading early in life. I, on the other hand, have developed a taste for chip, taste for books. I found Jonathan Livingston's ego particularly delicious. From Chester's kitten hood on, Mr. Munner has used him as a sounding board for all his students' lectures. If Chester doesn't fall asleep when Mr. Munner is talking, the lecture can be counted a success. Every night, when the family is sleeping, Chester goes to the bookshelf, selects his midnight reading, and curls up on his favorite chair. He especially likes mystery stories and the tales of horror and supernatural. As a result, he has developed a very vivid imagination. I'm telling you this because I think it's important for you to know something of Chester's background before I relate to you the story of the events following the arrival of Bernicola into our home. Let me begin with that first night. It seems that after I went to sleep, Chester, still stewing over the lost milk, settled down with his latest book and attempted to ignore the rumbling in his stomach. The room was dark and quiet. This did not prevent his reading. Of course, since as you know, cats can see in the dark. A shaft of moonlight fell across the rabbit's cage and spilled onto the floor below. The wind and the rain had stopped and, as Chester read at the Elephant's The Fall of the House of Usher, he became increasingly aware of the eerie stillness that had taken their place. As Chester tells it, he suddenly felt compelled to look at the rabbit. I don't know what came over me, he said to me the next morning, but a cold chill ran down, by, ran down my spine. The little bunny had begun to move for the first time since he had been put in his cage. He lifted his tiny nose and inhaled deeply as if gathering sustenance from the moonlight. He slicked his ears back close to his body. And for the first time, Chester said, I noticed the peculiar marking on his forehead, what had seemed an ordinary black spot between his ears took a strange vision, which connected with the big black patch that covered his back and each side of his neck. It looked as if he was wearing a coat. No, more like a cape than a coat. Through the silence had drifted the strange silver, remote and exotic music. I could have sworn it. I could have sworn it was a gypsy violin. Chester told me. I thought perhaps a caravan was passing by, so I ran to the window. I remembered my mother telling me something about caravans when I was a puppy. For the life of me, I couldn't remember that. Remember what? What's your caravan? I asked, feeling a, bit, feeling a little stupid. A caravan is a band of gypsies traveling through the forest in their wagons. Chester answered, Ah, oh, yes, it was coming back to me now. Station wagons? No, covered the wagons. The gypsies travel all through the land. Setting up camps around the great bonfires, doing magical tricks, and sometimes, if you cross their palms with a piece of silver, they will tell your fortune. You mean if I give them a fork, they'll tell my fortune? I asked. Bristlessly, Chatter looked at me with disdain. Save your silverware, he said. 
It wasn't Karen after all. I was disappointed. What was it? I asked. Chester explained that when he looked out the window, he saw Professor Micklewhite, our next door neighbor, playing the violin in his living room. He listened for a few moments to the haunting melody and sighed with a relief. I really got to stop reading these horror stories late at night, he thought. It's beginning to affect my mind. He yawned and turned to go back to his chair and to get some sleep. As he turned, however, he was startled by what he saw. There in the moonlight, as the music filtered through the air, sat the bunny, his eyes intense and staring. An unearthly aura about them. Now this is the part you won't believe, Chester said to me. But as I watched, his lips parted in hideous a smile, and where the rabbit bug's teeth should have been, two little pointed fangs glistened. I wasn't sure what to make of Chester's story, but the way he told it, it set my hair on end.